But let me introduce a man who really needs no introduction here at the Liberty Summer Seminar. Apart from myself, my sister, my mother and my father, he's the only other person who has been here uh, <laughs> since year one and every year since year one. Uh, I speak, of course, of shoeless Jan Narvison. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually a thing. I was, he was my professor at the University of Waterloo, where I did a degree, uh, a master's degree. And around the department, he would always walk around without his shoes. He would lecture without his shoes. It became a thing. I was surprised they didn't just call him shoeless Jan. Uh, Jan taught philosophy, as I said, at the University of Waterloo until his retirement in 2004. Uh, he continues teaching in the political science department there. Um, he was elected to membership in the Royal Society of Canada, which is like uh, this country's highest commendation for lifetime achievement in teaching. Uh, so he was an officer in the Order of Canada. Uh, he is currently distinguished professor emeritus at the University of Waterloo. He is the author of numerous articles, too many to state, I mean hundreds of articles. <laughs> Um, by some estimates, he is uh, either the most published Canadian philosopher or shares that status with uh, a, a socialist Canadian philosopher. So I guess they sort of, they cancel each other out, I guess, although Jan's work is much better than the other work. So, so we're the winners there. Uh, he's also the author of numerous books, some of which he has brought with, uh, with him today, uh, You and the State is a recent book that's available for $25, Jan. Twenty. Twenty dollars, yeah. even better. Uh, I'm going to save this one for last. He's the author of This is Ethical Theory. He has this for us as well. It's $20. You can buy it from him afterwards. And then finally, and I think in a way, uh, as far as his books are concerned, most importantly, he has this amazing book called The Libertarian Idea, which I recommend heartily. I read it in Hong Kong uh, while Hong Kong was under... Uh, Chinese rule, like uh, communist rule, or when they uh, when they were again under communist rule, I sort of felt uh, like an evil man at the computer, sort of reading this uh, the libertarian idea <laughs> in a communist climate that probably didn't like that. Uh, and actually, it was in Hong Kong when I first emailed Jan Arbison, and we've been friends ever since. Um, so let me introduce to you Shoeless Jan Arbison. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, today, um, I'm going to do the same thing I always do, except that I won't put projections on the screen, partly because uh, they're not interesting enough, uh, <laughs> and partly because, um, yeah, well, there were technical things. At any rate, my title today is Our Problem. And what is the problem? It is, why isn't libertarianism taken seriously? Meaning by sort of the general public, which it certainly isn't. Um, all of those who have gotten involved in Canadian elections will know that uh, a libertarian does extremely well to get more than, what, 1% of the vote? Do we often get that much, even? 1%. 1%, that's, that's sort of. 2% if we're lucky. 2 if we're lucky, right. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, we can say that we're not taken very seriously. And the question is, why not? Now, <clears throat> so most of my paper is uh, sort of an answer to that question with a major uh, illustration. I mean, the general answer is, well, you'll remember Abraham Lincoln saying, you can fool all of the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. What Lincoln forgot to add, or I think he didn't actually forget, is yes, but you can fool most of the people most of the time, which is all what you need to get elected in a democracy. And so here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Now, <clears throat> my main example, I'm going to go from sort of hands-on and concrete to more abstract as the paper uh, goes along. Um, my, my sermon for today is about uh, wind generation of electricity, which I think is a, a, a perfect example of uh, what's wrong and what is very, very difficult to fix. As you know, there are wind generators all over the place. You have but to drive much of anywhere in Ontario to see some, um, Europe, all over the place. Wind generation has become a very, very big deal. Many, many, many billions of dollars here, there, and everywhere are invested in wind generation, and the question is, why? 
why does wind power sell, as we put it? And the reason that's a question is because, after all, um, we're talking about major expensive. I mean, we're talking 40 cents a kilowatt instead of eight, that sort of thing. So why does it sell? Um, I think of four major reasons. In the first place, it is, quote, sustainable. And sustainability is a wonderful catchword these days. Because why sustainable? Well, because, you know, you don't use up anything, right? I mean, the fuel doesn't get, like, burned. And secondly, since wind is, after all, ahem, free, well, shocks, it looks like a truly economic proposition. And then, of course, it's ahem, clean. It doesn't emit any noxious gases, such as CO2, on which, by the way, we are all dependent for life. And so, D, it provides lots of economic opportunity for the makers and installers of wind turbines, right? So the question is, what's the problem? And the short answer is, well, the only problem is that the whole thing is a fraud. <laughs> Starting with the first one, um, sustainability, etc. Well, what is used up, and what, I mean, what isn't used up very much is uh, any bunch of matter, like coal isn't burned and so on. All that's used up is wind energy, and there's an awful lot of that. And uh, it would take an incredible number of wind generators all over the world to use up a very significant part of the total energy that's available. So uh, true enough, uh, the fundamental fuel of uh, wind generators is, uh, in a sense, very cheap. The trouble is, of course, the cheapness of fuel isn't the only thing. Indeed, if we look at the question of what's free and what isn't, the first thing to point out is something which is very, very poorly understood by almost everybody. And that is, so far as stuff in nature is concerned, wind energy, coal, oil, you name it, any of that stuff, insofar as it's just stuff, it's free. Think about it. There's no natural price on anything. What makes anything have a price is, well, somebody has to do something with it in order to make it useful. And um, if nothing else, he has to uh, discover it, find it, and think up what you can do with it. And he has to harness it, and he has to put it to use. And that's where all the expense comes from. So the fact that the fundamental energy is, quote, free, unquote, is pretty much beside the point. And as to so-called cleanliness, well, we'll discuss that a little bit later. Uh, carbon dioxide, as I say, is hardly a pollutant or anything like that, although President Obama seems to have managed to uh, elevate it to uh, that status. Um, <clears throat> but there are stories to tell here, which I am going to tell now at some uh, um, well, modest length. And that is, look, uh, the thing about the wind is it doesn't blow all the time. Did you notice? <laughs> uh, so what the politician tells the public is he produces some figures for, hey, look at how much electricity you can get from the wind, parenthesis, so pr providing that the wind is blowing at the right velocity and that it's blowing all the time, neither of which is very often true. About the right velocity, well, uh, when the wind isn't blowing at all, we get no electricity from them. And even when it's blowing at fairly normal, let me tell right, right now we've got a very gentle breeze, not enough to make a wind turbine go around at all. And indeed, if you let it go around at all, under this condition, it turns out, um, it's costing more to keep it going around than the electricity that it's generating. Um, and on the other hand, if it blows too hard, again, you can't, get, you can't use a wind turbine. Why not? Well, the thing about wind turbines is, in order to make them really useful, in order to make them generate a lot of electricity, they have to be very, very, very big. In <coughs> fact, they have to be absolute whoppers. Uh, a wind turbine that'll generate something like six megawatts of electricity, which is quite a bit, but it's trivial compared with what any decent gas turbine or coal generator uh, will do. Still, uh, it's a fair bit of electricity. Well, the things are over 600 feet tall. And those blades up there, which don't look like they're going around very fast, are actually pushing well over 100 miles an hour. And if the wind goes much faster, they will self-destruct. So 
there's a range. The wind is above that, you stop the turbines. If it's below that, you stop the turbines. And in between, there's an optimal ver velocity at which the wind is blowing sometimes, but not very often. Uh, in the United Kingdom, for example, um, the average uh, use of wind turbines runs about 26% of the available wind. And that's actually fairly good by world standards. A lot of them are worse than that. A lot in the United States are considerably worse than that, for example, or in, uh, in Canada. So when you're going to tell people how much electricity you can get, you should begin by dividing it by at least four. And it's, of course, the price you told the public about was at the optimal uh, output. Then you should mention, uh, by the way, it's going to be four times that much in actual fact. And since the price was pretty high to begin with, it follows that they're going to be extremely expensive. So the thing about uh, them being free is, uh, in short, a scam. Any politician who makes this kind of point is bluffing, he's kidding the public, and they very rarely tell us, well, never tell us the whole truth about it, to put it mildly. Uh, as to economic opportunity, yeah, well, the economic opportunity consists in having some politician pay you a whole lot of money to build, to build the things and produce electricity from them. Um, and it is several times what the consumer normally pays for his electricity. In Ontario, by the way, as you may have heard, it turns out that uh, almost all of the hydro uh, capacity in Ontario uh, is above the line of what we need. And because you have to keep the things going, and you can't just let them sit there, uh, the overage produced is sold to uh, things like Americans, people like Americans, I should say, uh, at a fraction of the cost that the uh, Canadian taxpayer is paying for them. So we are paying the people who produce electricity 40 cents a kilowatt to produce electricity which they turn around and sell to the Americans for a nickel. This is economic opportunity indeed. It's the same opportunity as provided by, for example, the mafia um, or by any friends of dictators um, anywhere. Now, to go back to cleanliness, of course, that's the big, big fundamental selling price today, right? So-called cleanliness is a function of, well, good old global warming. Uh, the, the claim is, well, you know, look, uh, we have to reduce greenhouse gases and all these other nasty things like uh, gas turbines and, and coal and oil-fed uh, uh, oil generators, uh, well, they produce greenhouse gases, and we can't have that, can we? Now, one of the things we get into here is the whole general uh, subject of global warming, and it is a large subject. It's large, however, uh, in, especially in a political way. And again, what you will hear politicians, such as my favorite Al Gore, telling you is that, quote, the science is settled, the science is done. Uh-huh. Uh, probably a lot of you were aware, maybe, of uh, a little item that came out in one of the major newspapers. I was amazed that it came out in the major newspapers, but there it was, from the British weather people reporting that, by the way, the temperature hasn't really changed, basically, in the last 17 years. 17 years of essentially flat temperature with, with, with no global warming. Bringing up the question, oh, uh, what was the problem with global warming? I mean, why are we getting so worried about it? Well, the idea was that, well, in some indefinitely far future, at least 100 years, uh, the idea is that, well, global temperatures ahem, might rise so much that it would somehow be bad for people. Now, to try to prove that they will be bad for people, at the uh, various um, uh, theoretical temperatures it might achieve is itself not a very easy matter since all pe kinds of scientists have claimed that actually the expected warming would, if anything, be better for people, be better for crops. Um, more people die of cold and of warm, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, never mind all that. The point is the theory of global warming is a bit of a catastrophe at the what we might call scientific practical level. By the scientific practical level, I mean this. There's a scientific theory about greenhouse gases, and that theory is decent, so, so far as we know. No doubt, um, when there's a great increase in greenhouse gases, that should have some tendency to uh, increase global temperature. The only thing is, yeah, like so many uh, theories of this sort, that's true 
other things being equal or other things being, equal, being neglected. Now the question is how many other things are there and how important are they? Well, it turns out that there's a myriad of these other things and they're way, way more important than the greenhouse gas theory. Um, you will perhaps notice another little item somewhere, and I got it by email from somewhere, to the effect that the new report of the IPCC is coming out, and the last one was in 2007, and the new one has revised all the estimates of how high the temperature might get downward by quite a bit. What do you know? Now they're expecting a, an increase of as much as 1.5 degrees C over 100 years instead of you know, brandishing figures like 4 or 5 or 6 in previous, uh, previous editions. Well, isn't that interesting? This is what the government is leaning on in imposing huge, huge costs. And I mean, I can't, uh, uh, I can't tell you, I can't emphasize this enough. These costs are real and they are astronomical. I mean, we're paying, we the people of the earth, uh, the equivalent of literally trillions of dollars, trillions, because of the so-called global warming scare, despite the fact that its scientific credentials as applied to actual predictable um, uh, bad consequences for people uh, are uh, frankly a shambles. Frankly, uh, it's a theory that's in perfectly terrible shape as an actual source of predictions about what might happen to people. So, I now move to more theoretical matters. What are we complaining about anyway? Well, what I've just given you is a dramatic example of inefficiency in government. Well, what's wrong with inefficiency? Well, what's wrong with it is this. What, what we mean by efficiency in the social sciences and the economics um, is not quite <coughs> like diesel engines and whatnot. What we're talking about when we talk about efficiency is this, that the policy is such that some people could be better off without making any other people worse off. That is to say, we don't need to impose costs on people um, in order to get the supposed uh, benefits. Imposing costs on people who themselves don't benefit from it at all is not on. That's what's inefficient. Why is that bad? Because inefficiency in this sense is in fact liberty. And what's liberty? Well, liberty is actually you and me and our lives. To say that our liberty is being imposed upon or violated is to say that the kind of life that we want to lead is one which some other people are compelling us not to lead. They're intervening in our lives to make, them, to make us worse off. How do you go about justifying anything like that? Now, the very short answer is, well, you don't. That's the libertarian message. The libertarian message is you were not justified in imposing on A in order to benefit B. If B wants something from A, what should B do? He should make B, he should make A an offer. That's what he ought to do. Um, and the other guy can either accept it or not as he pleases. And if he does, then both parties will be better off. And if he doesn't, then it's no dice. It's no deal. That, of course, doesn't happen with government. Why not? Well, because government is the repository of political power. Indeed, that's true by definition. What it is to be a government is to be a smallish agency in a large society, the members of which have the power to compel people to do things whether they want to do them or not as individuals. And that is, please notice, on the face of it, bad. This is something which we prima facie don't want. So in order to justify this, you have to show, uh, you have to give an efficiency argument. You have to show that somehow we are all better off by being subject to the coercion in question. What libertarians do is to say we have to all of us be better off, not just some of us, but all of us. Everybody has to be such that he's either just as well off or better off by virtue of the coercion being applied. Now, if you think about it, what that means is that the only people you can properly apply coercion to are people who are themselves guilty of imposing on others. That is to say, the only thing that can justify sacrificing anybody's liberty is that that person is imposing a sacrifice of liberty on somebody else. That's the libertarian view. Uh, it's, a, in a way, a very radical view. The funny thing, though, is it's not radical at all among, for example, political philosophers who have been saying this for hundreds of years. Now, <clears throat> um, 
why do people think that government is okay anyway? Why, does, why is this agency with all this kind of power supposed to be uh, acceptable anyway? Or it looks as though uh, if we're going to if we're going to hand power over to the government, we have to have some good reason for doing so. What is that reason? Well, of course, fundamentally, it's that you know we all the all, all we people with our individual pursuits and interests, we're different from each other, and our interests sometimes clash with each other. And so we have the question: who's right and who's wrong, and whose way is going to prevail against whom? Uh, there are well, the, the general answer of government is that it, it's a good thing to have authority. We need somebody who get in there and say, you're in the wrong and you're in the right, you lose and you win. But can you just say that? Well, that view is called authoritarianism. Uh, totalitarians, authoritarians, monarchs and so forth claim the right to tell us all what to do, no reasons given. No sensible person accepts authoritarianism anymore <laughs> Footnote, I said no sensible person. <laughs> there are some um, not very sensible persons who seem to still cling to this kind of thing. But basically, we all want to say, wait a minute, an authority who tells us to do something that we don't want to do has to have a reason for it. And that reason has to be that if I do do it, I am going to harm somebody. I am going to inflict some kind of damage, some kind of loss on one of my fellow men. That's the only reason that we think is acceptable. If we ask, why do we think that? Well, we can go into that subject, too. And in fact, um, I claim to have a pretty good answer to it uh, in, for example, this book. <laughs> um, but it's not a new answer. I mean, it's the kind of answer that lots of people have discovered, uh, of which my favorite hero is Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes is a very interesting example. He's a perfect example because he believes in libertarianism, and he also believes in absolute government. How did that happen? Well, the answer is by making a big, big mistake, as we will see in a moment. Meanwhile, it's pretty clear that if we're going to have government, we're going to have a problem which was um, uh, classically phrased in a wonderful way against Plato. Plato thought that you know what we ought to have in the way of government is a specially trained cadre of politicians who would be who would know all the answers. They would be the smart people, the wise people, and they would do the governing. And he calls them the guardians. And the question that people raised was, who guards the guardians? If they've got absolute power, who keeps them from misusing it? And of course, that was a big, big, big problem. And the trouble with um, uh, government by the one or by the few is, well, frankly, nobody does. Of course, if I happen to be the ruler, that's great. But if I happen to be anybody else, which is everybody else, then it doesn't look so good. Similarly, if we have government by Plato's elite, well, that's all very well if you're one of them, but what if you aren't? How to fix that? Well. There are two sort of things that we want to introduce at this point, and one is democracy. Democracy is, OK, uh, let's do government by giving an equal amount of power to absolutely everybody. So let's be, in that sense, self-governing. Now, please notice, democracy is not properly referred to as self-government. In democracy, what happens is not that each person governs himself, it's that each person governs everybody else. Everybody has power over everybody. Every hand is in every pocket. That's the way democracy works, and it resolves problems by elections. The people, whatever side has the greater number of votes, uh, gets put into effect, whatever that side may be. On the other hand, there's the market, the free market. And the market differs from democracy in that the market proceeds not by coercion, and not by majority rule, but by agreement. A thing happens if you, between you and me, if and only if both you and I agree with it. We both accept it. It's to our perceived benefit. In that case, it goes through and otherwise not. The nice thing about the market is it doesn't require elections. We're not subject to the rule of a whole lot of other people, whereas in the democracy, uh, we are. Now, going back to the, uh, democracy for a moment, democracy, of course, involves a lot of authority. Basically, democracy is, let's put the monarchy in the hands of a 
majority, not 100%, just a majority. Why should we obey authorities which uh, have been put in place by democratic means is the question. That's a question that's not asked often enough. And when people do ask it, they often get the wrong answer, which is, well, after all, democracy is self-government, which, as we have seen, is simply not true in any reasonable, straightforward sense of the term. So let's ask, why should we obey authorities insofar as we should? Well, I think that it requires two parts, a two-part answer. First, they have to know what they're talking about. And secondly, they have to have our interest at heart. I think it's clear from this morning's talk and various other talks that we've had here and all sorts of other things that you've read that um, the factota of even elected governments very rarely have our interests at heart. They do have their jobs at heart, very much at heart, but having our interests at heart is quite another matter. And as to knowing what they're talking about, here we have to distinguish between knowing what they're talking about in the sense that what they tell us is something that they believe to be true and in the sense that uh, they actually know what they're talking about, whether or not they impart it to us. Now, these conditions both tend to be absent. Generally speaking, politicians tell us lies instead of truths when it's in their interest. And secondly, they very rarely know anything anyhow. Uh, they make legislation on the basis of the same nonsense that you and I, uh, the public, often approves of with all those, uh, you know, um, uh, sound bites that are given as explanations, which tend to be full of errors, as in the wind turbine example. So the question is, will democracy help the fundamental political problem? And the answer is not very much. Uh, not very much because it's not clear that it's much better to be under the thumb of a majority of your fellow men than it is to be under the thumb of some dictator. Indeed, it will depend very much on who the dictator is and for that matter, who uh, the majority of your fellow men are. In either case, they could be pretty bad for you. If we turn to the market on their hand, it looks as though we've got a much, much better basic answer. Now, um, my fellow political philosophers, when they write about these matters, generally describe the fundamental general problem uh, to which, which politics addresses as the problem of distributive justice. I kind of like that word, distributive justice. What's it about? Well, it's about who gets what. Um, okay, what, that is to say, among the various goods that society produces. Now, the trouble with calling it distributive justice is that it sounds as though, here is the goods a great big pile of you know, like pineapples, right, or something like that. And here is the, uh, the potentate, the distributor, and here is all these people out here. And his problem is, how many of these things do I give to those guys out there and who gets them? To which, of course, the credible answer from the democratic view, point of view will usually be, roughly speaking, an equal amount. Well, the trouble is, of course, that the premise is false. It's not often realized how false it is. It's absolutely false. The stuff that's being distributed isn't a pile of stuff. It's produced. It's the services of people who work at various things, who discover things, who, dis who, who find things, who create things, um, and offer it to other people. So there are producers to take into account. And that means that there is a very plausible principle about distributive justice, namely, well, the guys who made the stuff. They're the people who should have it in the first place. They're the people who should be regarded as entitled to it. By the way, there's a, a simple answer to the question, well, why should that be so? Why should, why should the producer be entitled to uh, what he produces? The answer is, well, <clears throat> to say that he's not entitled to it is to say that you can take it from him by force. He could, of course, give it to you voluntarily, and they very, very often do. There are a lot of very generous people in this world, and they are no problem. And by the way, that's something that's worth bearing in mind when you talk with any of your uh, critics on the subject of libertarianism. We are not saying, we are not saying that things belong to their makers in such a way that they're not even allowed to give them away. You have to be a selfish bastard. No, you don't. Libertarian says you can do what you want with what you produce. 
whatever you want, so long as it doesn't actually inflict harms or damages on anybody else. If you give it to people who don't want it, like I leave this load of coal on your front porch, <laughs> which you don't want, well, I haven't done you a favor. But if we have a transaction in such a way that we both agree to it, then there's no problem, fundamentally. Both the buyer and the seller are acting voluntarily, and that's the rule of the market. All the market requires is that we recognize property rights, and property rights basically are the right of people to use whatever it is that they themselves have originated in some way or other, or which somebody else has voluntarily transferred to them. When you have a market, please notice, uh, I mean, the various benefits of the market were spelled out uh, in wonderful detail by Steve yesterday in his opening talk and all the books that you've been reading and so forth. Um, but an important point about the market is that when you, when you uh, get into a transaction, you of course take a risk. Uh, the other guy's product might be as good as he thinks it is. Of course, he might be lying, lying about it, and he's not allowed to do that uh, for the same reason, because he's imposing a cost on you if you do. But suppose that he's not. Suppose that it's an above-board transaction. Still, you're taking a risk. For example, the risk that you'll change your mind tomorrow and you don't want it anymore. Well, too bad. <laughs> Should have thought it better. Or um, you will think that the product is um, going to do more good for you than it actually will. But he didn't mislead you about that. That was your calculation. So the point is we internalize risk in the market. We don't have somebody else making the calculation for us. Notice that in the regulatory state that democracy has turned into, um, our risk calculations are continually being made by somebody else. The government is deciding what's good for us and not letting us decide that ourselves. And hence, you have horror cases, awful cases, like that of Monta Montana's uh, this morning. So it looks as though um, the rules of property and the market are the way to go. They are the way that is going to preserve the fundamental idea that we are not to invade each other's lives. We are not to, to impose harms on each other. We are to let people live the kind of lives that they want to live. So uh, democracy doesn't look as going to do this. Now, the market then looks like a very, very good s solution to an awful lot of problems. Question, will it solve all problems? That's actually a very, very interesting uh, question. It's much more interesting than most contemporary economists give it credit for. Why doesn't everybody see immediately why that the market is really uh, the way to go with regard to at least almost all of the problems that mankind faces? Answer, well, because of something called public goods, which you will have heard about, it, I'm sure. Now, um, you, there's various sort of characterizations given of public goods. Uh, all, all of, you know, which are reasonable characterizations. But the fundamental aspect of, of public goods from our point of view is this, from any political point of view, is this. They are goods whose cost and benefits can't be or aren't confined to their producers. Somebody produces it, and somebody else gets the benefit. Or the costs of producing it are borne not just by the producer, but by somebody else. In either case, we have a misallocation of costs and benefits. And so, when that happens, what do we need to do? Now, at this point, many, many economists think, well, as soon as you've got that, you need government. That's what government is for. It's to solve public goods problems, which cannot be solved, uh, resolved on the market. About this, they are, by the way, wrong. They are fundamentally wrong because, in fact, uh, those problems are frequently, at least frequently, solvable on a market basis. Let me have an example. You want to build a hospital. Um, and you need a certain amount of money to build the hospital. Suppose it's going to be a public hospital. Everybody's going to benefit from it, we suppose. All the sick will be treated, whatever. And the question, who's going to pay for it? Now, government's answer is everybody's going to pay for it, whether he gets sick or not. Um, but another possible answer is this. OK, look, I've got a group of people interested in building a hospital. We would like to provide this benefit people to people. Here's what it's going to cost. What do you say? Will you chip in or won't you? Now, we go around to each person in turn and we say, look, on the average, we need such and such an amount from contributors. Um, are you good for that? 
And suppose that the answer is, in too many cases, no. In that case, we say, OK, no hospital. End of story. Public goods problem solved. The public good doesn't get created. On the other hand, suppose we get enough money. There are some people who won't pay very much. There are some people who maybe who won't pay at all. But the other people who have paid say, that's all right. <laughs> we don't mind. We're willing to pay this much anyhow. And what do you know, the hospital gets built. Is this a, fancy, uh, uh, a fanciful, uh, fictitious kind of story? No, it happens all the time. I'm sure that most of you belong to some organization or other which has solicited your support. For example, um, <coughs> the Institute for Liberal Studies <laughs> and many, many others who solve public goods problems by shrugging their shoulders and say, look, we've got enough money to go on. We don't mind that there are some people who benefit without him paying. We're going to go ahead anyhow. Um, this is a, a, a neat, lovely solution to a typical kind of public goods problems. Are they all like that? That's a very interesting question. It's a question which deserves uh, a, a great deal of effort and has gotten it from a lot of our libertarian writers. <clears throat> Footnote, let me put in a little uh, ad for an interesting book by Walter Block on the subject of roads. Very, very interesting book proposing that we ought to have private roads, not public roads. Um, you can get that book for free. Uh, just Google, well, Google Walter Block and look for his book on roads. I forget the exact title, but you'll, it'll be obvious. And you can download, download it for free. Walter is a good example of somebody providing a public good at his own expense. Very interesting. Anyway, now, a more general point about public goods. There is one fundamental major public good that uh, uh, over and above absolutely all others, and that public good is peace, the absence of war or violence. Violence is when somebody imposes costs on somebody else by force. So if somebody collects the benefit at your expense by killing you or clubbing you over the head or robbing you or whatever. Peace is the absence of that. That's all it is. It's no more. Some people want to say, well, that's not enough. That's too negative. I say, it is enough. And if you try to give us any more, you'll discover that it's a way of imposing costs on us and slipping them over on us without us noticing it. <coughs> you'll notice that, I mean, you'll find that to be true all the time, by the way. So how do we control violence anyhow? Well, let me divide the general sort of ways into three. First, there's technology. You can control violence by, having, by being better armed than the other guy. You know? Um, being better armed than the other guy is a good idea if he's trying to attack you. If he's not trying to attack you, of course, it tends to attract the attention of other people who begin to worry about you and your intentions. And the other thing is, of course, uh, it gets you into an arms race. And arms races have a way of being pretty well lost by everybody as time goes by. And also, the main thing about, you know, war and conflict is somebody loses on either side. In fact, in one sense, wars are things that nobody wins. Um, the king wins, maybe, sometimes, if he's still alive afterward. Uh, but all the people who died lost. And there's a better way to do things. Generally speaking, peace is better than war. And that's, in a way, our fundamental message, that peace is better than war as a way of life, as a way of doing anything, and certainly as a way of running society. Two other methods. One is political and the other is moral. Now, political I've already talked about quite a bit. It has the huge, huge who guards the guardian problem. And the other thing I'll point out is that politics comes from morals. The reason we have the politics we do is because of what particular people, you and I and everybody, are willing to put up with and what we approve. We have to, in the end, go back to what's in there to find out why we've got the institutions we do. And so we need to start with ourselves and ask, have I figured this out? I mean, have I really learned um, uh, the lesson about peace? And if you think about it, I think you will find that the answer is, yeah, I ought to be in favor of peace. Peace is a good thing. Peace, of course, provided I can get it. I mean, I provide peace to you, provided that you provide it to me. Uh, mutual uh, lack of conflict is what we would like to have. And that's what the market can give you. So. I think that uh, the message is pretty clear. We've got the basic right kind of message. And I, I would want to just put it to you that uh, this is a message 
that has universal application. And it's fairly easy to see why it does. Fairly easy to see why Hobbes was right and why uh, all kinds of other people who uh, think that the government has a lot more authority than it should have, including the other Hobbes, the ones who wrote uh, politically rather than morally, are wrong. What we need is minimal government or, of course, ultimately, better yet, no government. Uh, what's morality, by the way? Well, notice, please, um, 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 uh, a point I have to make that's very important. Gov moral your morality isn't just your values. We all have lots and lots of values. I, for example, hate broccoli. That's one of my values. But I don't think that I have any business compelling other people not to eat broccoli. Needless to say, I don't think that anybody has any business compelling people to eat broccoli either. Morality has no business with, with imposing rules about broccoli. That's, a, that's an individual value. And we all have lots of individual values, and most of them have nothing particularly to do with morality. Or rather, they needn't have. There's always that temptation to take your values and try to force them on everybody else, like Joseph Stalin and all the dictators in history and essentially all the governments in history. But don't. <laughs> what morality is, is a rule for everybody's behavior. That is, to have a morality is to have a view about what everybody ought to do. What then we are, for example, justified in compelling other people to do, especially that part of it. I mean, there's sort of two branches of morality, two, two big, you can make a big general division. One is behavior control by force. What can we compel other people to do? And the other is behavior control by recommendation, by suggestion, by example, etc. They're both very important, but they're also very different. And the first one takes priority because if you don't have a life, then being influenced by other people's example and so forth doesn't matter. And the trouble with um, other people coercing you is they deprive you of your life. So I'm concentrating on that part of it. And so we want to talk especially about uh, the part of morality that's often called justice, which is what can we compel people to do? And when we address that problem and we ask, OK, we've got all these people all over the world and they differ in all kinds of ways. What basis is there for agreement? Can we find a basis for a worldwide, general, universal agreement about what's right and wrong? Answer, yes. And it's not actually all that terribly difficult. Here we all are, able to, do, to make a nuisance of ourselves to other people. We're also able, most of us, almost all of us, to do other people a lot of good. And what we're asking, when, when we put out a rule like this, we are asking other people to buy the rule. We're saying, here's what you all ought to do. What makes that a rational rule? Answer is that the people to whom I address it would find it worth buying. They would find it a good rule to live by. So if I say, OK, here's what the rule ought to be. Uh, you lick my boots and give me everything I want. Thank you very much. Or maybe no thanks. Well, this isn't the rule that's going to sell very well. And if we try to find, mm, are there any rules that don't have that property? There is only one answer, and that is the universal rule of respecting other people's liberty. Anything else is going to involve a violation of somebody's life in a way that he doesn't want, and so he's not going to agree with it. If we're looking for universal agreement, it looks as though this is it. That's why libertarians are justified in being so sure about themselves. It's because they're right in the light of reason. So what we want to do is to uh, impose, literally impose, peace on everybody. That is to say, we only coerce coercers. We only punish people who, who violate uh, this reasonable rule about how to behave in regard to others. So our problem is, A, how do we get everybody to see that that's what the fundamental issue is, and B, how do we get them to see that government so often violates that rule that it's, generally speaking, a mistake? I wish I knew the answer to that one. Good luck. <laughs> By the way, let me recommend to you all this book called The Wind, if you're interested in the wind farm thing, wind uh, turbine generator. Um, the technical accounts in this book are really quite wonderful, and it's fairly brief. It's by a guy named John Etherington, who's a British engineer, and he knows a lot about it. If you meet anybody who wants to defend uh, 
wind farms, be armed with this information. And you may be sure that he's not going to get very far. Our question recognizers will, will administer the questions. <laughs> so I don't want to uh, defend wind farms. And I, I agree with like everything um, that you said in regards to uh, the government subsidization of that. But I, I, I will potentially um, uh, defend um, some of the global warming science um, from a scientific point of view. I mean, you said something which I thought was pretty interesting. What's well, that issue, remember, isn't like that the science it's the application of the science yeah, yeah, yeah. to politics i'm gonna get to that um because you said something very interesting as you closed up that topic right um you said that that the only justifiable um use of coercion is in response to coercion that deprives other people their liberty yeah. and i posit you this i mean you you said something interesting you you, you conceded that the best science today shows that that uh, global temperatures will rise by mm. about 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next hundred years. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, um, you know. But we also know things like we know that that we don't have uh, you know uh, um, uh, an isotropic atmosphere, which means that you know temperature changes are felt at different magnitudes in different in in different parts of, of yes, the planet, indeed. and. And even at 1.5 degrees, there's there's good reason to believe that there would be significant changes in in, in rainfall patterns and um, ice coverage. And so, when I'm I'm not trying to convince you of global warming. I'm actually trying to ask you a very theoretical question. So far, you question. haven't said anything relevant. Yeah. To it. Well, that's where I'm coming. Did you to notice? It. Assume, <laughs> assume, assume for a second though that you accepted that these things were true, that yeah. human activity was in some way entangled in these changes. Yeah. And that some let's some theoretical town, let's like put it any, anywhere in the world, it can be in North America, South America, Africa, was flooded as the result of rising ocean levels. The question I would posit you is this: Is it really okay enough to say that um, that that doesn't constitute some extended form of of, of coercion, depriving people of their property and their liberty as the result of non-internalized, non-captured costs by what? economic actors. Yeah, in case you didn't notice, I didn't say it didn't. Yeah. The, 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 the thing about global warming is, if its premises were all true, it would provide a pretty good reason for coercing a lot of people, mm -hmm. if they were. So everything depends on whether they are. Now, these premises aren't just the fundamental science theory. They are the scientific theory of that plus all the other relevant science, mm -hmm. much of which isn't known yet, mm -hmm. in application to actual human uh, situations. And that's where life gets very difficult. But there, but there is because, a problem. Because as things are, it is impossible. Well, as one author that I've uh, read, uh, here's another uh, useful source, yeah. by the way. There's a, a wonderful little book. It's an anthology called yeah. Climate Coup. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to And one of the people in it said, uh, Mo nobody ever has and nobody ever will die as a result of global no, but, warming but, but, is but, the way but, he puts but it. But the, prob but the problem is, though, I think, I, think, I think you're setting up a bit of a false dichotomy. I mean, you say, you say some things which are true, that most of the climate models have had poor predictive power. I don't disagree with that. That's not in dispute. But at the same time, um, a lot of uh, uh, like the, the fundamental evidence that's causing people to try and build these models in, to begin with is not in dispute. Like, I mean, what's not in dispute is that carbon dioxide levels are rising rapidly. Um, and what is in dispute is what the effects of that are. What is in dispute is what will actually happen to the climate. And I agree that the models have been, have, have been extremely poor predictors of those, of those things. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I think it is a very dangerous position for us as libertarians at this point to basically be like, oh, this is just a big like socialist scam. Like, in fact, but I, I actually I think I think it's very incumbent upon us as as libertarians to potentially start looking at this as a potential property rights issue, um, as as a potential issue on the horizon, and to capture that debate if it if it if it does become like a real environmental uh, concern for this planet over the next hundred years, as Look, as you say. Yeah, about the environment. If I shit on your property. Yeah. I'm liable. Sure. I can't do that. Sure. If I impose on you by generating a whole lot of CO2, which turns out to be warming the globe to the point where you get sick or whatever, yeah. I've inflicted a damage on you and I am liable. Yeah. Prove it. 
That's all I ask. Prove it. Now, the, the theories we've got are so far from proving it, so far from, that there's absolutely no power yeah, but, whatsoever, yeah, but none, you, you none, have to, from, you, the, get, current, get, from as, the current available science, you can induce, as a, as you can deduce absolutely nothing of that as, as a, if, yes. you, if you could, if you could, yeah, but, you'd have a case. But I mean, I, I mean, yes, I mean, I mean, yes. I mean, I mean, you're getting all Karl Popper on it, right? On this, but I mean, no, I mean, I mean, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I, come on now. Yeah, at a fun, at a fun, at a fun. Yeah. At, no, but at a fundamental, at a fundamental argument perspective, at a fundamental argument, you, you can always do this. You can always say you have to prove to me exactly what's going to happen in 25 years. What's no. exactly going to happen to me no. No, in 50 no. years? No. So, so what? So, so what you're saying is the only option is like post hoc, beyond like once once the damage but is I'm done. But I'm not saying that either. All you have to do is have good evidence, plausible, more plausible than the opposite. To okay, convict well, that, the guy. That, 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 okay, to, that's a, could, that's a, that's a perfectly in, acceptable and, answer. Okay, yeah, that's all I wanted good. to know. And and the point is, we don't have. That. We're we're so yeah. far from having that. My, that. I mean, the idea, the idea that you can justify the kind of thing we've got now, which are yeah. coercively imposed laws on everybody sure. on the basis of what we've got, is zilch. That's and, the point. And we're in it is fraudulent. We're, we're we're in violent agreement about all these ridiculous yeah. government programs, right? You're Including, like about like we're not we're not we're not arguing yeah. about that. Yeah. I'm just the claim isn't that we yeah. couldn't be. It's that we aren't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> By the way, Marta has a, has a question too. <laughs> yeah. I I I would like to approach this on a different point, and again, it's a global warming. Side. First of all, I think libertarians are really good at philosophy. <coughs> we are really good at analyzing things deductively. We suck on science. Okay. So fundamentally, I'm not going to go, I don't think there's any point for us hashing out a scientific argument here because none of us is in any legitimate way qualified unless you actually can show evidence you're qualified. So I'm not having that debate. The debate that I have is the following. Okay, it's twofold. First of all, to assume that right now we have an energy system, that we have an economic system that is not the result of government policy is bizarre if we simply say, oh, we can't have all these windmills, et cetera, et cetera, because that's government imposition, when the entire energy system that we have right now is largely as a result of government policy in the favor of elites and of well-connected industries that get favors from government. The point about windmills is not that they may be imposed or not. The point about windmills where we can actually win the argument with people who believe in global warming. And let's assume global warming, it's irrelevant whether it takes place or not. The mm. point is, even if global warming is correct, windmills are not the answer because they don't bloody work. Yes, okay? roughly speaking. So if we libertarians want to shoot ourselves into the foot right at the beginning of the debate and take ourselves out of the debate as credible partners in a debate, all we have to say is, oh, this global warming stuff probably isn't even true. End of debate, we are shut out. Nobody's listening to us because we sound like the cranks we are. So what we have to do, <laughs> we have to go over that and say, let's accept the fundamental science on that on which we're not qualified to argue and therefore say, okay, let's say the CO2 stuff is a problem. What is the best way to address it? Windmills ain't it. And therefore what we should do is what actually contributed to this global warming? Government policy, subsidizing of highways, subsidizing of suburbs, subsidizing of the entire damn industrial structure that we have today, which is not the result of free markets, but largely as a result of government policy, particularly post Second World War, shaping it. Okay? So all we have to do in reality is to make the argument that we have to get rid of these damaging policies, which are damaging socially, politically, economically, and environmentally, and then we probably get rid of this global warming problem anyway. So my final position is as libertarians, we would actually be much better off embracing the science of global warming, saying, okay, we accept it is actually a problem. And the solution to it is less government, because government costs it in the first place with interference in the economy and fucking it all up. And the only <laughs> way it can be solved by unfucking it, by getting the government out of it. And all the solutions that are currently proposed only make it worse. Uh, yeah, I, I would accept that, generally speaking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Although, I mean, I would note my, my, uh, what I want to say about most electric generation, like gas uh, and so on, is my, my fundamental question is this. If you're a consumer uh, and you're offered 
uh, electric, uh, electric service at the following price, would you take it? Now, if the answer is yes, then, you know, we're in the ballpark. Suppose that we've got government producing the electricity, then we've got to ask, well, would absolutely everybody take it? Would, would absolutely everybody be willing to pay what they are now paying in order to generate it? And the, off, the question there is often, no, they wouldn't. And if so, do they have any alternative? In which case, often the answer is, well, yeah, sort of. For example, you can go without electricity. But then we come to the, the, the cases where the government doesn't permit anybody else to get into the market. And then the government is in trouble. But generally speaking, I would want to say most electric generation by normal methods is something the consumer finds worth it. If, but if people knew the facts about wind generation, they wouldn't buy it if they had their choice. And the problem is they don't have their choice. And that's the problem. So I wonder if you could just clarify one point you made. Yeah. Make sure that I have it right. Did you say that producers justly own the products of their production? Uh, did you say that? Yep. And is that just a variation on Locke's point about labor? And when you say variation, it's a way of saying that what Locke says uh, is not too well formulated. Yeah, I wonder if you could just spend a quick second explaining that. Yeah. OK. Well, see, Locke talks about mixing your labor with something, and that's what confers the value on it. Now, that's a misleading metaphor, which gives rise to the theory of value, what's called the theory of value in economics, called the labor theory of value. Now, the labor theory of value should say that somehow labor as such confers value on whatever it's mixed with or whatever, whatever it produces as such. That's clearly nuts. That's simply wrong. All right? What's right is all transactions Economics, firstly, economics is about transactions. That's what it's about. That's all it's about. Secondly, <laughs> transactions are between people. Some of them control, command some sort of resources. Others command, control some other kind of resources, which includes their labor and also various things that they've made with their labor and whatnot. They get together and they make a trade. Now. What's true is that whenever any transaction occurs, somebody has produced something, in some general sense of the word produce. He has put in some kind of effort in his life, however minimal, um, and uh, such that he's the one who rightly controls this, and he makes a deal with somebody else on the basis of mutual agreement, period. It is not the case that there's something called labor that we could sort of independently measure the amount of and, and uh, attribute a certain uh, definite value per unit of. Uh, if you look at Marx's theory, I mean, by the way, see my, my essay on, on Marx, which I, I take a certain pride in. Uh, um, the labor theory of value in Marx is, is really basic to his whole theory, and it's completely wrong. And his defense of it is completely, completely fallacious. Uh, if the theory meant anything, it would be, as I put it, that what confers value, economic value, on anything is this mysterious but intrinsically valuable substance that you put into it by uh, exerting yourself. That's what's completely crazy. Completely crazy. Uh, the amount of value you can confer on some things by doing almost nothing just having a brilliant flash of inspiration in a moment is far, far greater than what some idiot can confer on it by working for the rest of his life, right? Obviously. So what I said about the theory of value was um, that kind of the Marxian kind of understanding of the, of the Lockean theory is completely crazy. But that value is always a function of what people are interested in and want in relation to what they can get. Uh, that's what's important, right? So value is fundamentally, as Bastiat puts it, service. By the way, I, I recommend Bastiat very highly on this. Um, his essay on value is one of the great brilliant things. When you get something from me, I perform a service by, by, by transferring it to you. If I didn't, you wouldn't buy, right? And I wouldn't accept the price unless it was you know, what you're willing to pay me, unless it was a service to be in some way or other. If you offer me money and I don't want money, I won't take the transaction. 
right? So it's always a service, an exchange of services that makes economics go around. And it's true that the service often is a function of the amount of labor that you've put into it in some sense of the word labor, but that varies all over the map. And there's no uh, clear correlation between something called quantity of labor and something called price or quantity of value. <laughs> okay? <laughs> a little bit about global warming and there are two words prevention and cure I'm sorry what prevention and cure with global oh. warming we are so anxious about preventing it to happen because some entities are going to make money on that and with cancer we're going for cure why it's not opposite direction we should go preventing the cancer to happen and the cure eventually if global warming happened, but this two way will cut the money for both entities, right? Yeah. I don't know if I'm very clear about, we are always running for cure with cancer instead of preventing it for happened. Nobody's going for that because there is no money. And we are preventing global warming instead for just relax and wait Maybe it will occur, but it's we don't observe it yet. And if it will happen, our intelligence we will deal with that later. Okay. I, I, if, I, I, if I've heard you rightly, I, I think I agree with everything you say. I mean, what's happening currently is that uh, the politicians are spending trillions of dollars to try to prevent something global. called global warming. And I mean, there are a lot of things that we know about this. One thing we know, the scientists sat down and, and made some calculations after the Kyoto agreements were made. And what they discovered is very interesting, and that is that if all the provisions of Kyoto were fully met by everybody, which of course they weren't, and everybody knew they wouldn't be, but even if they were, the amount of difference it would make to global temperatures after 50 years was, guess what? .05. Almost unmeasurable somewhere between 0.07 and 0.15 degrees Celsius after 50 years. Now that's so little, there would be absolutely no way to know whether what you did caused it or not, right? I mean, that's zero. Uh, and spending you know, billions and billions and billions of our dollars in order to bring that about is obviously crazy. No individual would ever, I would, <laughs> no sane individual would ever uh, buy something like that. You've gotta do better than that. And climatology, I mean, well, the, the, the global warming people uh, tend to exaggerate it and say, you know, talk as though there were a big benefit to it. But there isn't. It's their fellow scientists have told us that. So part of the point is whatever is happening, and even if we are, in some sense, producing the global warming, the things that we're proposing in order to try to, to stop it are completely ineffective and therefore not worth what we are uh, charging people for. It. I mean, that's the beginning. And of course, the further point is, we don't know how much global warming uh, can go on before it ceases to be a benefit. It's not clear at present that what they're predicting would be a detriment rather than a benefit. Lots, most people think, well, most people who have thought about it say, that looks better to me, not worse. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's the point. I mean, the, the, this, the global warming thing, the premises are up there, and the costs to us are, are way over there. And you can't get from here to there. I mean, by the time you've, you've got there, it's all completely uh, befuddled. And that's not a basis for public policy. Public policy has got to do better than that. Thank you very much, Jay. Okay. <laughs>